In this screencast, we're going to be talking about the structure and function of the nervous system. So, this is kind of a difficult uh, topic to discuss, but when we go into the biology of psychology, this is what I really like. I think this is really neat. So, why do we act the way we do? Well, the human brain is literally the most complicated thing that's ever been discovered in the universe. It's really amazing to think that we are taking our brain and using our brain to understand how our brain works. It's pretty phenomenal. The brain is composed of all sorts of different types of brain cells, but the important one is called the neuron. There are estimates that there are 100 billion neurons in your brain. And there's 100 billion other brain cells that support brain functioning. Each brain cell, each neuron is connected with between 1,000 and 10,000 other neurons. And they communicate with each other between 100 and 1,000 times per second. This is so vastly complex. It's just mind-boggling to me. So where is the brain? Well, if you were in class, I'd touch your tip of your finger and I'd say, can you feel that? And you'd say, yes, hopefully. And I'd say, well, where is your brain? And you would say, well, it's in your skull. Then why can you feel me touch the end of your finger? Well, it's not necessarily that your brain is at the tip of your finger. I mean, it kind of is, but that's the nervous system. And so the nervous system is your brain, but outside of your skull. So you would say, oh, that's a nerve. Well, a nerve is like a neuron that's outside of the brain. So really, in some ways, your brain is everywhere in your body, but technically that's your nervous system, and the brain is in your skull. <clears throat> so what are the basic functions of the brain? Well, the basic functions of the brain are to move you around remember this is basic so there's motor functions motor means to move around and there's sensory functions it needs to take in information from the environment so the motor functioning would be like your muscles and like your smooth muscles too like your heart and respiration most of that happens on an unconscious level same with sensory information. You think you're aware of everything that's coming in, but really it's just a tiny fraction. So if I ask you the question, are there different types of neurons? I hope you would say yes, but what are the types? Well, based on what I just told you, you should say, well, there should be sensory neurons and there should be motor neurons. That's right, but there's actually three types of neurons, sensory, motor and interneurons. So sensory neurons bring information up to the brain and motor neurons take information down. Sometimes we call that afferent and efferent or ascending and descending neurons. And interneurons connect other neurons. The brain and the spinal cord form the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system is everything else, the motor and sensory pathways. How do neurons communicate with one another? Well, what they do is pretty complex. And think of a neuron like a tree. So the branches of a tree are the dendrites here. Information here is taken in from other neurons. So another neuron would synapse right here. And all a neuron does is tell another neuron how excited they are. But there's two types of neurons. There's excitatory and inhibitory. So it's like a gas pedal and a brake pedal. And if the brake pedal neuron is really excited, then it's going to be inhibitory. It's going to say, don't fire. But an excitatory stimulus would say, fire. So all the neurons do is tell each other how excited they are. And if that level of excitement hits a certain level or threshold, there will be an action potential. 
So all that is added up right here in an area called the axon hillock. And if you reach the threshold, a chemical signal will travel down the axon. And we can measure that as an electrical signal going down the axon to the terminal buttons. Like think of an airplane terminal, the end stop here at the end of the neuron. And then there will be another neuron, actually many, many, many neurons, like potentially a thousand other neurons that this neuron is connected to. So remember that. That's called the action potential. So there's lots of little tricks to remembering the names of the structure. Soma, like the body of the neuron, literally means body. Dendrite means tree. Axon means line on a sundial or axis. And the terminal buttons, think of little buds at the end of a branch. Here's the definition of a soma. It's a cell body of a neuron which contains the nucleus, all the DNA is there. Dendrite is a branch-like tree structure attached to the soma of a neuron and receives information from terminal buttons of other neurons. A synapse is a junction between the terminal buttons of an axon and the membrane of another neuron. An axon is a long, thin cylindrical structure that conveys information from the soma of a neuron to its terminal buttons. Here's another drawing. So again, information. These are called presynaptic neurons because they're before the synapse, and this would be the postsynaptic neuron. Information comes in. The uh, terminal buttons can synapse on all sorts of different places on the neuron. All that excitatory and inhibitory information is summed up. If the excitatory exceeds the inhibitory and reaches a certain threshold, the action potential will travel down the axon. And again, at the terminal buttons, neurotransmitters will be released. Some of the structures inside the um, inside the soma of the nucleus, or the, and I'm sorry, inside the soma of the neuron, these are called organelles. You have DNA, the nucleus, which has the DNA, mitochondria, which are like the powerhouse of the cell. The cell membrane is the outer layer. Cytoplasm is inside the cell. Extracellular fluid is outside of the cell. There's also glial cells, and glial means glue, and they were kind of thought to be the cells that held everything else together and were the support system of the nervous system. But recent research has shown that glial cells and astrocytes might also be uh, important for thinking. Astrocytes support the nervous system and provide nutrients and other substance to the cells. They regulate the chemical composition of the neuron. They have connections with the blood vessels. They can bring nutrients in. Oligodendrocytes are a fancy type of glial cell that forms a myelin sheath. So at the end of the myelin sheath, they call them swan cells that wrap around the axon, this provides like an insulation. Think of like plastic on a wire. And that insulation is called the myelin sheath. And it surrounds axons and insulates them. And it prevents messages from spreading between adjacent axons. And it also speeds up neurotransmission. There you can see an oligodendrocyte. And then the Schwann cells here wrapping around an axon. We call that myelination. So these would be myelinated axons. And there's little gaps here called nodes of Ranvier. The nodes of Ranvier are the naked portion of myelinated axon between the Schwann cells. There's also uh, microglia, or really, really small glial cells that act as phagocytes and protect the brain from invading microorganisms. 
there's the Schwann cell that's kind of out of order. Again, remember that's this right here. Here's a, a drawing of this. The pink is the axon here, like a tube. Think of a tube, like sliced down the middle so you're looking down a hose. And the Schwann cells just kind of wrap around the axon. And that's what it, they remind me of, a jelly roll. So here's a video MS exacerbation. talking about MS. Dynamic and destructive attacks by autoaggressive immune cells on the central nervous system <laughs> cause devastating symptoms and a measurable and sustained effect on the patient's disability. Oligodendrocytes myelinate axons in the central nervous system ensuring that neural impulses are efficiently and quickly transmitted. An MS exacerbation is instigated when a circulating T cell becomes misprogrammed to target and attack myelin. The T cell releases cytokines to recruit similar T cells, B cells, and macrophages to mount the attack. These inflammatory cells are able to cross the blood-brain barrier, which normally separates immune cells in the periphery from the central nervous system. Once inside, the autoaggressive T cells release more cytokines to activate B cells, macrophages, and microglia, propagating a cycle of inflammation. The B cells produce antibodies. The macrophages and microglia release cytotoxins. Together, these destructive elements attack the myelin sheaths, axons, and oligodendrocytes, leading to cell disintegration. These damaged areas of myelin, visualized as active lesions on an MRI, disrupt the transmission of nerve impulses. Patients can suffer symptoms such as impaired vision, sensory disturbances, and problems with gait and balance that last from days to months. These symptoms interfere with their mobility, safety, and overall quality of life. Fortunately, MS exacerbations can be treated with approved therapeutics that target excessive immune responses and inflammation, leading to improved symptoms, reduced short-term disability, and accelerated functional recovery. So that little video on MS there, I'll bet you you've heard of multiple sclerosis and you might even know somebody with that disorder. So what it is is a disorder of the Schwann cells of the myelination and it's really uh, an unfortunate disease there's drugs to treat the symptoms but there's nothing that we know that cures it so you learn about something crossing the blood-brain barrier here BBB you've learned about uh, what the myelination is and so there's lots of diseases like that that we can explain with the neurology of the brain so you have a better understanding. The video talked about the blood-brain barrier. That's a semi-permeable barrier between the blood and the brain produced by cells in the walls of the brain's capillary. And uh, the cells form what are called tight junctions to keep material in your blood out of your brain. And there's a lot of stuff in your blood that you don't want in your brain. Think about like disease so like bacteria viruses uh, poisons toxins stuff like that it protects your brain your brain's super fragile there is one area where the blood-brain barrier is really weak it's called the area post rema and it's in the medulla and here is where poisons in the bloodstream can be detected if you stimulate this area it'll make you vomit like crazy Okay, so when we talk about neurons and how they communicate, we need to talk about the all or nothing law. And this is the action potential is totally unaffected by the amount of stimulation. You get one action potential, one size, that's it. And once you have an action potential, no matter how much further stimulation you have on that neuron, you have to wait a while for the neuron to fire. So an action potential and firing mean the same thing. 
Here's a secret method that I've been using to teach students how to conceptualize a neuron firing. Okay? Alright, all right. now let's look at this again. So again, information comes in here, excitatory or inhibitory. You add up the excitatory, you subtract the inhibitory. If you reach a certain threshold here in the axon hillock, the neuron is said to fire the action potential, which will travel down the axon to the terminal buttons where neurotransmitters will be released. Now, what do you think the secret method is to understanding this? Well, you might laugh. Hopefully you will. It's a toilet. Now, think of a neuron as a toilet. And you got to use like a, an old school toilet like this. So think about jiggling the handle. If you pull up, nothing. If you push down, you'll get a little noise like that. Psh, psh, psh. Think about that as the action at the dendrites. Inhibitory up, excitatory down. And if you reach a certain level, that toilet's going to flush. A flapper's going to pop up. And once you flush a toilet, it's not like you can take it back. And that's what happens. And you can't really vary the size of a flush. It's all or nothing, just like a neuron. And then once the toilet is flushed or fired, can you flush the toilet again right away? No, you can't. You have to wait. That's like the refractory period. So action potentials are generated by voltage-gated ion channels in the cell's plasma membrane. That sounds confusing, but let's look at this. So there's a bunch of neurons. Let's go down into the axon in the cell membrane. So these blue little things with the tails, that's our phospholipid bilayer membrane. And we have these channels. An ion is a charged particle. Maybe you remember that from chemistry. And the only ones that I care about for this class are potassium, here is K, like on the periodic table of elements, and Na, which is sodium. So what happens? Well, think about this. This is my trick to understanding this. Potassium is in bananas, right? And sodium is in salt. Now the extracellular fluid outside of a neuron has almost the same composition as seawater. So do you want that sodium outside or inside? And do you think you want the potassium outside or inside? Well think like you'd want to eat the banana and go swimming in the ocean. That's how I think of it. So potassium is in a greater concentration on the inside and sodium is in a greater concentration on the outside. And we can actually measure an electrical difference between the outside and the inside of the neuron. And there's little pumps that pump the potassium in and the sodium out. And think about like if you took a drop of black ink and dropped it into a cup of clear water, what would happen? Well, that ink would slowly diffuse out and it would go diffusion goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until it reaches a level of equilibrium and that's what happens here these channels pop open in succession down the axon so the signal travels down and these gates open potassium goes out sodium comes in and it depolarizes the neuron it's that electrical activity that we can measure that we call firing and we learned this from axons from giant squids. Actually, the researchers that discovered this, their names are Hodgkins and Huxley, and they won the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1963. So here's an example. Think of your toilet. You have the potential to flush. That's like the resting potential in a neuron. And you're jiggling the handle here. And then you push that handle kind of hard. And you reach a point here where you can't take that back. You reach a threshold and the neuron fires. All those voltage-gated ion channels, they, they pop open and the axon depolarizes. And then it slowly repolarizes. And then here, down here, is like after you flush the toilet, you can't flush it again. You have to wait 
until the resting potential builds back up or the tank fills with water. So the direction goes like this. You have your dendrites here. They take in information and it travels down the axon. And then that information reaches the terminal buttons. And this is where those neurotransmitters are released. And the neurotransmitters then go and chemically talk to other neurons. So the electrical signal never leaves a neuron. That's what a synapse looks like. And so that signal would come down here. And then in here, that's where the neurotransmitters are released. Neurotransmitters are released by the presynaptic neuron and bind to the receptors of a neuro another neuron, which is the postsynaptic, like pre, before, post, after. Here's a video showing this. So those signals travel down the axon, reach the terminal buttons, and then jump over to the next neuron. It happens really quickly. And if we zoom in here, you can see a terminal button synapsing with another neuron. And when that action potential reaches the end of the terminal button, that's when the neurotransmitters are released. So, does the brain work with electricity? What's the answer to that question? Ooh, that's kind of a tough one. Well, sort of. It does. You can measure the electrical activity of the brain really pretty easy. That's like an EEG. But really, it's chemical. So the chemical activity has electrical charges that are associated with it. So it's a little bit of both, but that's kind of like a trick question. All right, that's it for now. If you have any questions, make sure you email me. Here's a quick summary. We talked about the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the tr three types of neurons, motor, sensory, and interneurons, action potentials, the resting potential, the all or nothing law, the voltage gated ion channels, synaptic transmission, and neurotransmitters. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. So that's it, email me, contact me, whatever you have to do. Uh, read the book, because I know this information is confusing.